And, and really this series is going to kind of wrap around the fact that uh, a life following Christ is, is not a life that's a safe life. You know, I, I think there, there's kind of a misconception sometimes where we think everything's just going to be simple if we start a relationship with Jesus. But really, Jesus doesn't call us to a safe life. He, he calls us to a life of risk. In fact, uh, when we look at our own lives, I, I can look back and think that, you know what, there were times in my life where I was more of a risk taker than I am now. Because as a kid, I was always the guy that wanted to try something new and cool. I mean, I, as a little boy, I remember we'd ride our bikes around the neighborhood. My friends and I would, would take shovels out into the dirt, and we'd build a really big jump somewhere. And I was always the first guy to hit it. You know, I always had one of those friends like, Dan, you can do it. And I always, always did that. And I remember the many times I injured myself doing this. You know, I, I can remember a time we mil- built a makeshift ramp out of two pieces of wood. There was like a seam in the middle, and, and I flipped my bike over the front of it and broke my front teeth as a little boy. And just remembering those type of moments where I'm like, I didn't matter what was going to happen to me, I was going to be the first one to try it. I was all about risk. Well, I recognize as I've gotten older, uh, I've really changed the way I look at things like that. Because it used to be, you know, you knock a tooth out or you break a bone and it's like you bounce back and it's really simple. And now I'm getting a little older and I've heard old people talk about this my entire life and think, oh, they're just a wimp, you know. They're like, you don't bounce back quite as easily anymore. And I'm starting to understand it. I'm starting to recognize it. I'm, I can remember just like two snowboard seasons ago, we're taking our girls to the bunny hill at Powderhorn and, and, and trying on the beginner hill to teach them how to, to go skiing. I remember I was tying into my snowboard. So we're not even up the mountain yet. I'm standing in the lift line at the bottom of the hill, and I'm, I'm strapping into my snowboard, kind of losing my balance. I fall on my back, right? I hurt for two months after that. I laid there, I'm like, forget this, I want to go drink hot chocolate, you know? I think it's like the more pain we go through, we start to get a risk aversion. And now I experience pains, I don't even know where they come from. Like, I'll get out of bed some mornings, I'll like, I'll get into the bathroom, start to shave a little bit, I'm like, oh, somehow I pulled my shave in the face muscle, man. I'm like, ow. I'm like, babe, what did we do yesterday? She's like, you sat on the couch all day, Dan. I'm like, ow. I don't even know what happened, you know? But I think because of pain and because of failure sometimes, we can become, have, build like a little aversion to risk. I don't want to take a risk because that might hurt. That might not go so well. But really, that's not the type of life that Jesus calls us to. And today, I want to take a look at a risk taker, a man by the name of Matthew. And we're going to look in the book, book of Luke chapter 5. This is Luke's account of this story that took place. When a man named Matthew took a big risk. I'm going to go ahead and jump into this. Luke 5, verse 27. It says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. Okay, so Levi is also known as Matthew. He's one of those guys that had two names, kind of like Simon Peter. He was known as Simon or Peter. Well, it's the same thing. Levi was also known as Matthew. So it says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 31. Jesus answered them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So really in this story, we have a a main character. The main character here is Matthew. Matthew, at this time, has a profession which is the most hated profession in all of Israel. He was a tax collector. See, at this time, uh, Israel was, um, was occupied by the Romans. And Rome would require people to collect taxes and then make payments back to Rome. So what Rome would do is essentially uh, they would sell off tax franchises. So there were actually people who were, who were Jewish people who would basically renounce being Jewish and decide that they were going to buy into a market where they could start collecting taxes, collecting money from their fellow countrymen. And then what they would do is they would tax an incredible amount of, of these 
uh, men that they live their lives with, they take money from them and then just send a portion of it to Rome and keep the rest for themselves. Basically, it was just legalized extortion. So what would happen is a person would become extremely wealthy becoming a tax collector, but it would come at the expense of being hated. All the Jewish people hated the tax collectors. They felt like, you know what, these, these men are traitors. They're liars. They're, they're manipulating. They're hurting people just to gain more way, wealth for themselves. And they were becoming extremely wealthy, basically off of the money of the innocent. So Matthew was one of these men who was completely despised. And one day, Jesus came up to Matthew and he decided to invite Matthew to walk away from this life, this life that was gaining him wealth, but, but it was stealing from every other part of his life. And he said, Matthew, why don't you stop what you're doing and come and be one of my disciples and follow me? And the Bible tells us, and we don't know why this happens, but so quickly Matthew just decides, okay, I'll do it. And I don't know why he was so quick to make that decision. Maybe he had been sick of the life he was experiencing. Maybe he was so sick of the hateful stares that he was getting every day. Maybe he had been hearing about Jesus and starting to believe more and more and more that maybe this is the Son of God. And all he needed was an invitation. But for whatever reason, Jesus says, why don't you come with me? And Matthew excitedly says, okay. And he, he, he quits what he's doing. He stops collecting taxes and decides to live a new life, a life following Jesus. So Matthew's life radically begins to change. And imagine with me how much different his life then became. Instead of a life being consumed with trying to gain more finances and wealth and spending every day lying and manipulating and cheating to try to get a little bit more in his own pocket, his life was now based on following Jesus around. And following Jesus and watching Jesus heal people. And watching P Jesus pray for people. And watching Jesus lay hands on people who are sick. And then, and then his mind was being blown every day by Jesus' teachings. As, as Jesus would begin to go into different city and different city and tell people about the love of God. So his life is, is vastly different from where he was just a couple days before. In fact, I've run into people who... Uh, I, I've kind of seen this happen before. In fact, there's one guy in particular. I, I can remember that uh, I remember seeing him get saved. And then I remember seeing that he would be here on a 9 o'clock service on a Sunday morning. Then he'd be here at, at the 11 o'clock service. And then after people were leaving, he'd be one of the very last guys to leave on a Sunday. And then he'd be back for Tuesday night for classes and, and volunteering and serving back in 4640. And then I remember on Wednesday night, he'd be back for classes. On Thursday, he'd be here for Celebrate Recovery. And I remember coming up to him one day, and I was like, man, you should just move in here. And he's like, you'd let me do that? And I'm like, That's just a joke, calm down. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I love it. And I said, man, you were here all the time. And he said, Dan, I wasted so much of my life, so much of my life abusing drugs and alcohol and just trying to serve myself, and he said, I don't want to waste another second of my life. I kind of imagine that, that that must have been what it was like for Matthew here. One of these guys who looks back at his life and realizes he wasted so much of it. He was serving himself, but now he has a chance to follow Jesus, and his life is being radically transformed, and he's saying, you know what, I'm not going to waste another day of my life. I imagine how this was for Matthew. And it, one day, for reasons not revealed in the text, Matthew, following Jesus around, begins to think about his old friends. He begins remembering his old tax collector buddies, the guys that they would work together all day long, and they'd make a bunch of money, the guys that they'd celebrate with together at the end of the day, like, we, we did really good today, or the days where it was difficult. These were the guys that he spent his time with, his, his old friends. And as he's thinking about his life and thinking about their life, he he begins to wonder about them. You know, how much different would my friends' lives be if, if it was them who was singled out by Jesus and not me? Because they were all there, and they saw Jesus invite Matthew to a new life. And he wonders, what if it would have been them? What, what if their life was radically changed and I was back in that place? I mean, my life is so much better, and, and how much better would their lives be? How much would they benefit from a personal relationship with Jesus? What if they weren't experiencing the hateful stares anymore of countrymen, but instead they were being, 
beginning to experience the love of God and his perfect forgiveness every day of their life. So he begins praying for and thinking about these friends and, and starts thinking, you know, I, I wish I could tell my friends about Jesus, but practically, how's he going to do that? He doesn't know anything yet. He doesn't know enough to be able to go and preach to them. He can't he go say, well, let me talk to you about the scriptures. He doesn't know any of that. So practically, how is this even going to work? And he begins thinking and praying and planning until one day he gets an idea. And this idea pops into his mind. You know what? I used to throw parties all the time, and my friends would come to these parties. And what if, just what if, I threw a party, and, and my friends that were tax collectors would all come, and then I would invite my new friends, Jesus' followers, to come, and I'm even going to invite Jesus to this party. What if I got them all in the same room? See, this is where it gets a little bit risky for Matthew. This is where we see that he's a risk taker, because there's so much potential of what could happen here, but then there's, there's so much potential of what could go wrong here at the same time. He's thinking, you know, Maybe I could throw a party and I could get them all into the same room and maybe there could be some conversations between Jesus and some of my friends. And maybe some of my friends who are living a life that is so disappointing to them, that they're, they're so unfulfilled, could start to experience what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus. So he, he takes the risk and he kind of throws this idea out there. I mean, w- would Jesus even come to a party like that? Would Jesus even come and hang out with a group of tax collectors? And then, then think about this risk. What, would his friends be offended by the fact that, wait, you, you got me here just so you could talk to me about Jesus? I mean, so much could go wrong here, but he decides, you know what, I'm going to take the risk. And he begins planning, and, and he sends out the invitations, and then the Bible tells us he throws a huge banquet. We know he's incredibly wealthy and he has the ability to throw a party, the type of party where other people hear about it and start crashing this party. So it's not just his friends, the tax collectors, but people from town are coming into this party. And then it starts to work out exactly the way that he would hope. Jesus and Jesus' disciples show up at this party. So he looks around and he sees some of his old friends and his friends are actually conversing with Jesus. His friends are actually starting to talk to Jesus, and he's thinking, this is going so great. I never would have imagined this would have happened so well. And and just when things are starting to look great, the worst thing happens. The party gets crashed. Not by cops. That would have been bad enough. But the party gets crashed by religious cops, religious people, Pharisees, judgmental people. And these Pharisees come into the room and And they're looking to embarrass Jesus. They're looking to try to catch Jesus doing something wrong so that they can accuse him. And and they come and they say to Jesus, Jesus, how can you claim to be the Son of God and eat and drink with such immoral people? You say you're the Son of God, and look, you're in a room full of sinners. You're in a room full of tax collectors. You're in a room full of people who have just made mistakes in their lives over and over and over again. And imagine with me how Matthew must have felt at this moment. Oh, I didn't think this was going to happen. I, I didn't see this happening. I, I didn't think for a moment that, that this would get this awkward, this would get this tough. But we know this doesn't rattle Jesus at all. Jesus is not shaken by this at all. He turns to them and quickly answers them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I mean, where are doctors supposed to hang out with, really? Are, are, are they supposed to hang out at wellness centers? No. Doctors hang out where there's sick people. And then he turns to them, and if you understand the subtlety of this verse, it's so beautiful. And in verse 32, he looks these Pharisees right in the eye. These people who, he, they find themselves so self-righteous. They're, they live life so perfect. He looks them right in the eye, and he says this. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the center, sinners to repentance. He's looking him right in the face and saying, you know, see, you already think you don't need me. You're already so self-righteous. You you know you've got it so together that you don't need me. You don't need forgiveness. You don't need to be right with God because you're so right on your own. See, you think you got it so figured out. So I'm, I'm not here to talk to the people who think they got it so figured out. Jesus says, I'm here for for the sinners, like you say. This room's full of them. People that are hurting that know that they need a relationship with God. 
And then I'm sure the Pharisees at this moment, they did what they tried to do. They, they, they tried to embarrass Jesus. They feel like they accomplished that, so they left. And then the text doesn't tell us how the party ends. But I could just imagine, if you allow me a little liberty here, um, uh, to just imagine for a moment, at the end of this story, I kind of imagine a conversation taking place between Matthew and Jesus. A conversation where, first of all, Matthew would have gone up to Jesus and be like, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I didn't expect that to happen. I, did, I, I, I wasn't trying to get you in trouble with anyone or get you embarrassed or anything. I, I wasn't trying to accomplish that at all. I'm sure Jesus was like, you know what? I've dealt with bigger obstacles than this, and I'm going to deal with bigger obstacles in the future. That's child's play. No big deal. But then this is where my mind really starts to turn and where I felt the Holy Spirit start to talk to me about this verse this last week, is it started making me think, what would Jesus have said to Matthew after this? And I kind of imagine these are a couple things that, that maybe Jesus would have said, is that, you know, Matthew, thank you for not forgetting about your friend. Thank you for taking the risk. And I think that because as I read this scripture, those were the two main things that I began to ask myself. And, and two questions I want to challenge you with today before we leave is to ask yourself these two questions. I want to just pose it right to you. These are two questions I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me that I want to pose to you right now. Is Number one, are you remembering your friends? Are you remembering your friends? See, so many people, we get fired up about our new life. Things are different. I'm not experiencing the same problems I used to. My life is different. I'm moving forward. I'm happy and and it's so easy in those times to forget about our old friends. And are you remembering them? Have you forgotten about them? Your old golfing buddies. The other moms you used to hang out with. You know, friends on the sidelines. Your old, your old drinking pals. Have, have, you, have, have you forgotten about these old friends? And then have you ever imagined what it would be like if, if they had a relationship with Christ? Have you ever dared to imagine what it would be like if seeing your old friends start a relationship with Jesus, to ask for forgiveness. Have, have you ever dared to imagine what it would be like to, to watch your friends get baptized? Maybe to stand next to you in a worship service like this, and, and you're raising your hands and singing, how great is our God that, that your friend is standing right here next to you, someone who maybe never has been to church before. Could you imagine them standing next to you, singing and worshiping God right alongside of you? Maybe teaching their kids about Jesus' love and, and breaking generational curses and starting a whole new legacy and a life that is moving forward because Jesus is at the center of it. Are you remembering your old friends? And the second question so clearly that I felt the Holy Spirit whispering to me as I read this is are you willing to take a risk? Am I still willing to take a risk? Because I know in so many areas of my life I've I've taken risk and I've failed and it's hurt before. And in those times, I, I, I start to develop a risk aversion. I, I don't want to get hurt anymore. You know, I, I don't want to go through the awkwardness anymore. But I wonder, am I still willing to take the risk? Am I willing to devote even five minutes a week to praying that, God, would you give me some sort of an idea? Give me one idea where I could effectively start talking to my friends about Jesus. Where I could effectively start loving on them the way that Jesus would want me to, and start communicating that there's a God who loves you. See, to be honest, every person that I have ever talked to about Christ has required risk on my part. There's not been a single time in, in all the years that I've talked to my friends about Jesus, there's not been a single time where it's just been risk-free, simple, downhill the whole way. I feel like every time I've ever talked to my friends about God, there has been risk involved. And a lot of it has been because of my own selfishness. Because I think, you know, there's a lot of weird Christians in the world. There is, you know. And we've run into those weird Christians. And I think, you know, I don't want to risk my friends thinking I'm one of those weirdos. I don't want to be lumped in with that. You know what I'm talking about. There's, there's the people who they seem perfectly normal. And then it's like you get into an elevator with them and their voice changed. The doors close and they turn around like, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. You're like, what are you doing, man? That's just thinking weird, right? Or the person who starts praying and it's like a surprise prayer. You didn't even know you're praying. You're in the office hanging out and it's like you're talking about the basketball game. Did you see the basketball game last night? You're like, yeah, man, that was awesome. Oh, God, we love you so much and we thank you for that basketball game. Like, oh, we're praying right now? I didn't know we were praying. 
You know, what are you doing, right? And I think we've run into those people. In fact, there's so many people I run into on a regular basis. The only understanding they have of Christians is like what they see on church marquee signs. You know what I'm saying? I brought you some church marquee pictures that, that people actually write this stuff and put it out in front of their church. I want you to take a look at some of these things here. Uh, honk if you love Jesus. Text while driving if you want to meet him. <laughs> right. That's a good one. That is. Uh, check this out. Looking for a sign from God, this is it, right? And keep going. Whoever stole our AC unit, keep one. It's hot where you're going. I mean, really? Check this next one out. Whoever stole our mower, God will get you. I mean, people are stealing from churches, apparently, right? Check this next one out. Going to hell, you are welcome. That was a fail right there. I love this one. Now is a good time to visit. Our pastor is on vacation. <laughs> this is precisely why we don't have a marquee here at Fellowship Church. But you know, I think the truth is, for me personally, I don't want to get lumped in with any weirdos. So I've had this real selfish idea of, you know, I... I, I, I don't know if I want to talk to this person about God yet because they might think I'm a weirdo. They might think I put weird stuff on signs out in front of my house. They might, you know, they might think my weird turns all, my voice turns all weird when I want to talk about Jesus. And, and for whatever reason, I found myself struggling with the fact that, you know what, it's the most important thing, yet it's a risk. And, and, and why is it that I find myself scared sometimes to talk about God? And, you know what? Every time I've ever talked about God, there's been risk involved. I can think of times when I've sat down at a meal with someone, and we're five minutes into the meal when I feel the Holy Spirit begin to whisper to me, you know what, talk to them about me, the hurting. And I'm like, no God, not right now. This, if it doesn't go well, this is going to be a long, awkward meal. You know, you just feel that, no, this is the best time. You know, I, I can think of the times when I've had people close to me in my life, and I've, I've watched their life headed towards a train wreck. And, and all the while feeling like God was saying, you got go say something. Don't be the person who's just going to sit by and watch their life fall into destruction and then go try to pick up the pieces later. Don't do that. Stop them. I remember a guy who uh, he found out his wife had cheated on him. And he, he began, he was so hurting, he began so many reckless behaviors, and, and I felt like God was saying, you need to go talk to him. And I, I'd see his, his habits changed and his attitude changed. There was a day that I just kind of had to pull him aside and say, hey man, I don't understand what you're going through, but I know you're hurting, and I just want to talk to you a little bit. That took risk. It, big time, it took risk. See, inviting a person to church that said no 50 times before, that takes risk. See, pointing people to faith has always been and will always be risky business. And that's exactly why we need the Holy Spirit to strengthen us. We need to bathe ourselves in prayer before we do talk to our friends about God. Before we do take these risks. So we don't become the type of Christians who are just have an aversion to risk and say, you know what, it's not worth the risk, it hurts too much. Because guys, we are playing for the highest stakes. This is eternity we're talking about. We have loved ones that you and I know right now that if they were to die today, they would go to hell. And that's the truth. And when we actually put that into perspective, when we realize our loved ones are going to hell, it, this is bigger than just my comfort for a moment. And this is when you can start to see a Matthew say, you know what, even though it could be uncomfortable and even though this could go so wrong, I think it's time that I say something. I think it's time that, that I talk to this person about Jesus. Because the single greatest gift that you can ever give someone in life is an introduction to the God who loves them. Introducing someone to a God who will eternally love them, eternally forgive them. That is a, that's a gift that will pay off second after second of every minute, of every day, of every month, of every year, for their entire life and then throughout eternity. You give someone a million dollars and they'll thank you for it, but if it doesn't change their soul once this life has ended, that's where the thanks will stop. The single greatest gift you could ever give someone is an introduction 
to the God who loves them. But I know for me personally, sometimes I need a punch in the chin from the Holy Spirit to say, Dan, get back on track. That's what this is about. It's not about being comfortable. It's not about a safe life. It's about the fact that you have friends and loved ones who are going to die without me and go to hell. I want them to come to me. And we have to start realizing that, you know what, maybe the people that are in our lives that are a little bit difficult to be around, maybe we're in their lives because Jesus wants to help us introduce them to him. 99% of the people in this room, you work in the marketplace in all, all sorts of different areas, but you, you work with business women, men and women in our city every week, and I can't tell you how often I hear this and, and how much it just bothers me week after week when someone will come to me and begin to complain. You'll say, you know, people at work, they, they cuss too much. Or people at work, they sleep in the wrong bed at times. People in the workplace, they, they drink the wrong drinks and they vote the wrong way. They're just so obnoxious. And it, just, it eats at me because I'm thinking, it's like, man, I would give anything to spend some of my time in the marketplace around people like that. Because, I mean, for 40 to 50 hours a week, I am surrounded by Christians. I mean, think about that. Straight lace, Bible toting, praying Christians, 40 to 50 hours a week. No challenge there, you know? I get stopped in the hallway and like, Dan, I want to pray for you. I'm like, well, I just got prayed for around the corner, but okay, <laughs> here we go. Because <laughs> I think sometimes I, I just want to be in an environment where you can really truly feel the hurt and the pain and, and, and the need that people have for Jesus. The need that, that, that your coworkers have, that they're saying, you know what, I, I would do anything to know that there is a God who loves me. So it is no accident that you work where you work. It is no accident that you have the relationships that you do. It is no accident that your office is where it's at. God has put you there because it's your opportunity. It's your mission field. It is a target-rich environment where you can go to people and share with them that there is a God who loves you. But it takes risk. It takes saying, you know what, uh, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone today because it's worth it. You know, if I, if I just live the rest of my life being, having an aversion to risk, I'm never going to accomplish anything. I'm never going to succeed. But it takes risk. So what I want to talk about in the last, like, two or three minutes we have together today and then what we're going to continue in a little bit this next week are here's some real practical things that you and I can do to take risk. Five very practical things that we can show the love of God. It's simple. If you write these down, it's a good reminder for us that these are some things I can do that it's a step out there like Matthew saying, you know what, I care about my friends enough. I care about my coworkers enough where I'm not going to just sit back and watch their lives fall apart, but I want to introduce them to Jesus. So here's five things. Number one, very practical ways to share God's love. Number one, offer to pray for someone. Offer to pray for someone. This is, is a very simple thing and it's an easy thing to do where you say, you know what, you, you just mentioned that your kid was sick. I just want you to know I, I spend a little time every day praying, and uh, if it's all right with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to God about your child and pray that God will heal him. Or you said your car broke down, and I, I, I just want to spend a little time, if it's all right with you, praying about that while I'm praying today. And it's kinda, it kind of takes the pressure off where someone maybe who's not very receptive to it, you know, you're, you're not asking the, the next step, and the next step is this, offer to pray with someone. You'd say, you know what, I'd like to pray with you right now. Would, would it be okay if I prayed with you? This is something my wife is great at. I make fun of her all the time because she doesn't care who's around. When she wants to pray for someone, she will offer to do it. In fact, I've joked about the fact we'll be like in the drive through at Wendy's, and, and she'll hear the woman on the other side of the speaker, and, and Amelie's like, you having a good day? She's like, well, it's a day. Like, do you mind if I pray for you? Like, I'm sitting in the driver's seat. She's leaning over me trying to pray into the speaker. God be with this woman today. I'm like... <laughs> she just, she's an awesome, I love it, but it stretches me, and I remember uh, just this last week, we're walking through Sports Authority, and we ran into a woman 
who was having a rough day, and Amelie just grabbed a hold of her and said, do you mind if I pray for you right now? And she laid hands on her and started saying, God, I pray that you would come and bring comfort to this woman right now. And this woman, by the end of this, uh, I mean, it might have felt awkward for some people sitting around, but what this woman needed right now was a touch from God, and, and my wife didn't care what happened. She took that risk, and by the end of this, this woman is just weeping and thanking and going, oh my gosh, because she experienced love from a person because of the love of God. So we offer to pray for someone, maybe offer to pray with someone. A third thing is to invite. It's a simple thing, invite. I don't have all the answers, so just come with me. Come to church, check it out. Next week, my kid's uh, being baptized, come check it out. Or next week, there, there's a baby dedication on our church, come check it out. And just come with me. I love that there's a story in First John or sorry, John chapter 1 is what it is, where Philip meets Jesus, and then he decides he needs to go tell his brother Nathaniel about Jesus. And Nathaniel starts with so many questions. It's like, how, how could anything good come out of Nazareth? What are you talking about? Who is this Jesus? And Philip didn't have all the answers, so he just simply answered, I don't know. Come and see. I don't know the answer to that question. Just come and see. I think a lot of us have an aversion to inviting people because we get those weird questions. Well, why does the church think this? Or why do you vote that way? Or why do you do this? Or why do you do that? And the answer can just so simply be, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but just come and see. It takes a risk sometimes to invite. Then the fourth thing is give a resource. Give a resource. This could be like a CD or a book or something like that. We talk to people all the time who are like, you know, you might run into someone like, oh, it's so difficult raising a teenage daughter. You know what, I don't know anything about that, but I saw a book on that in our bookstore. Let me grab it for you sometime and just bring them a gift. So they're, they're receiving teaching and love that way. Or, or you said something about your marriage, you know, I, I don't know anything about that either, but I, there's, here's a good book or here's a CD on that. Give a resource. And then the last thing, very practical ways, is just a simple act of kindness. Simple act of kindness. We forget sometimes how far holding the door or carrying a box will go. When someone is hurting and they just want to know, does anyone see me? Does anyone know that I'm here? Does anyone know the pain I'm going through? Sometimes God will give you a little prompting in your spirit and say, go help that person. Go carry that for that person. And we sometimes never know how far it goes. Those five little things, they're not that difficult. They're just little risks that we can take, but it, it brings us back into a proper perspective of going, you know what, it's worth it. And it is worth it. In closing, uh, before we leave, I, I had a neighbor by the name of Brian for years. And, and every day I would get home and he'd be outside working on his truck, drinking a six-pack, and I'd go sit down next to him and talk to him. And after I developed a relationship with him, I started inviting him to church with me. Say, hey, we're doing Dad Fest this next week. You got to check out. There's going to be a car show. Come with me. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I'd invite him over and over again. And, and weeks turned into months as I'd come over and he'd be like, You're going to invite me to church again, aren't you? And I'm like, Yeah, I sure am. You know, Brian, come to church with me. He'd be like, I don't know. Maybe someday. I don't know. So finally, what happened three years later was that I moved away. And I still have not seen Brian in church. We think, well, Dan, why would you give that story? Why would you end with a story of a failure? Well, first of all, I don't know if it's a failure. But second, I think there's a, there's a stigma that, well, it, it, it's easy because you're a pastor. It's easy because you work at church. And it, but the truth is, anytime we talk to our friends about God, there's risk. And Jesus wants us to take that, us to take that risk. Because I could have told you stories about, you know, it, I, I talked to this person, and they came to church, and now they're serving in our children's ministry, and they got married here, and so many wonderful things happened. But, but the truth is, sometimes you and I will experience failure. And when we experience that failure, we tend, it's our human nature to say, you know what, ooh, now I'm developing a risk aversion. That hurt, and I don't know if I want to do that anymore. But the truth is, you and I will never be successful if we decide, you know what, I'm just going to sit back and not take any more risk. If you would bow your heads with me. God, I pray right now before we leave this room that you would begin to fill us with the boldness. Fill us with the compassion and the love for our loved ones. And then, God, I pray that we would be the type of people that are willing to take risks. Because, God, we know this is eternity we're talking about. 
We know that you love our friends, our coworkers, our family members, and you want us to take the risk because, God, thank you someone took the risk for us. So, Lord, I pray that this week you would begin giving us opportunities. Give us the opportunity to pray for someone or with someone. Give us the opportunity to invite. Give us the opportunity to do a simple act of love and kindness and, and just to show your love in a very practical way. I pray you be with us today and give us the type of boldness we need so that when we leave here, our lives would resemble you. We ask this all for the glory of your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's give our God a shout of praise. It's good.